welcome everybody and uh, to this evening's event, which has been brought to you by the 9-11 Truth Alliance, who got word that Susan was coming to town and needed a place, and so we uh, arranged the Lucky Lab as a uh, suitable venue for her kind of talk and book selling, signing event, and I just want to... Uh, spend a few moments and just talk about uh, the 9-11 Truth Alliance and what we've been up to and what's coming up and uh, then briefly introduce Susan and get this talk underway. And I assume, you know, you'll talk for a little while and then there'll be some oh, discussion. Oh, yeah. lots of questions. Yeah. Anything you want to ask, okay. we'll, talk, we'll stay and well, talk. All right. Um, and I'm glad you said that because I think that's a real hallmark of the 9-11 Truth Alliance. It's uh, the thing that's really special about the 9-11 Truth Alliance is that it um, insists on free thinking and free speech and critical thinking. And it really reacts quickly to gatekeepers. And when, you know, these phrases come up, you know, and a lot of people don't know what they mean offhand, but once you've studied uh, the events of 9-11-2001, it's been almost 10 years now, one realizes that, um, you know, there are all these cliches that you can throw up, you know, we're in the <laughs> Matrix, it's 1984, it's all sorts of uh, highly controlled, highly uh, spectacle is being thrown at the public in a very coordinated and nefarious manner in a way to get the populations of the world to be docile and not think and be afraid and do what they're told and not speak out. And the 9-11 Truth Alliance is one of the few groups that refuses to stop speaking out and to stop thinking. And so by coming here tonight, you're part of this tradition of enlightenment and resistance and truth seeking. That's kind of been the hallmark of a lot of the higher cultures of this planet and it's a real disappointment that we seem to be entering this period in which uh, truth and enlightenment, far from being cherished, are being stamped out with uh, the likes of Guantanamo and any and other torture chamber you care to name. So. Anyway, if you want to talk about these things, you can come to the 9-11 Truth Alliance meetup meeting, which uh, every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock at the True Brew Coffee House, which is on Southeast Milwaukee, just south of Powell Boulevard, on the east side of the street. I don't remember the exact address. It's um, right there. We meet at 11 for, I don't know, as long as people want to talk, really. And then uh, we also attempt to put together some other events and things. Uh, coming up, of course, is the 10th anniversary of 9-11, 10 years of war and torture and ripping up the Constitution and crashing the economy, and here we are. And uh, we're about to be treated to a media bloodbath in which they're gonna rev it all up again, maybe this time for Iran. And, um, We'll be doing our counter events. We're gonna, we've, um, it looks like we will have Jim Fetzer, who has talked about 9-11 also for a real long time. And he'll be speaking on Friday the 9th. And I believe it's gonna be at the Selwood Middle, or the Selwood Community Center down in uh, Southeast Portland. This month? This September. Oh, September. September. And then on Saturday, uh, in the same building, we hope to have kind of an all-day seminar for beginners and then for more advanced people on uh, the ins and outs of 9-11. I mean, there have been all these fabulous documentaries done about 9-11, all kinds of documentaries done. I mean, there's information up to the wazoo about it, books, etc., etc. It all doesn't appear to pierce the hardcore media grip on reality, but uh, we're going to talk about it anyway. And uh, it's down in the Selwood Community Center, and we're here in the Lucky Lab because uh, the 9-11 Truth Alliance has experienced the backlash of truth-telling in this town. 
Uh, we've had various different events, and we've been chased out of venues time and time again. Chased out of venues, uh, one after another, and you know, this is the reality of where we are right now. I mean, uh, liberal friends who we thought were liberal friends turned out to just be liberals. <laughs> and uh, they appear to be just as more in favor of Obama and bombing Libya and attacking Yemen and you know, shredding the Constitution and instituting, you know, rendition here in the United States. And I guess employing Guantanamo tactics at Pelican Bay and other supermax prisons now in the United States where there's a hunger strike, which you also wouldn't know about unless you, like, kept your ear extremely close to the ground. I mean, Pelican Bay, our very own Guantanamo, is actually just over the border in California from Oregon, so it's not even just a few hundred miles from here, and they're torturing people right now, right there. So anyway, it's a dark time, but I'm really happy that we're still able to practice our free speech rights and have a speaker like... For now. For now, for like Susan Lindauer, who has had her own story to tell of being in the fold of the uh, national security state and then kind of being kicked into the hole for not going along with it. Yeah. And um, I'm really excited to <laughs> hear her talk about it. I've heard a few of the prices she's had to pay with her family and others, so it's like whenever you really start telling the truth, you've got, I mean, you know, I hate to be so doom and gloom, but you've got to be prepared for the consequences. There are some serious consequences. And, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, keep in mind that it's not all about now, it's never always been about now. We're, we're dealing with the future now, and we're fighting for the future. And you know, that's where we're at. So, here we go. Thank you. I have to say, I am so pleased to be here. I have waited 10 years, 10 years to tell this story. Uh, I remember after 9-11 when my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, told me that uh, there really wasn't going to be much of a 9-11 investigation. And we were going to try to keep the people calm. That's what he said. We're going to keep them calm. Uh, and I said, what do you mean? <laughs> uh, he said, well, we don't really need them to know everything that we were doing before 9-11. And I said, well, why? <laughs> what do you think they're, what, what do you think's going to happen when they find out that you didn't tell them the truth? Why don't you just tell them the truth right now? And he said, well, that's not really what they want to do. So I had, uh, and, and uh, I had different ideas. Uh, I will tell you straight off the bat that Right after 9-11, my CIA handler received a $13 million payoff from the 9-11 investigation that was supposed to be money used for the Iraqi, uh, to secure Iraq's cooperation. And I ended up getting indicted on the Patriot Act. I was the second non-Arab American ever indicted on the Patriot Act after Jose Padilla. And my crime was in opposing terrorism and, and going to Congress. And I had spoken to the staff of Senator John McCain and Senator Trent Lott, and I had pounded them. I called their chiefs of staff, their legislative directors, and their foreign policy people. And I said, I wanna, I'm, I'm an asset who covered Iraq and Libya at the United Nations. And I have a story to tell, and you need to hear what I have to say. And within 30 days, I am not making this up. This is actually, doc thanks to the Patriot Act, uh, <laughs> uh, all of my phone calls to these offices are taped by the FBI, so I can actually prove that they occurred. And I have the dates, I have the, phone, I have the actual phone conversations on tape. Uh, and within 30 days of those conversations, I woke up to hear the FBI pounding at my door, and I got up out of bed and I looked out the window and there are men in flak jackets in my porch. And I open the door and I, they, they come into my house and they're like, Ms. Susan, and the FBI agent is shaking. He's shaking. And he said, uh, you are Susan Lindauer, you are hereby notified, you are under arrest on the Patriot Act. And I said, what? You, may, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say, et cetera, et cetera. He read me my Miranda rights and I was just like, 
what are you talking about? I'm making coffee. <laughs> you know, I'm not a bank robber. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a murderer. I haven't broken any laws that I can think of. And, and I have no idea what you say that I've done. He said, well, your attorney will explain it to you later on. Okay? Okay. That began a, a five-year indictment, five-year nightmare on the Patriot Act. I was never taken to trial. I never, I was, in five years, I was allowed one morning of testimony with two witnesses. The two witnesses were a chief of staff, former chief of staff for a congressional member of Congress, and my old friend, Park Godfrey, who verified the 9-11 warnings that I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to let you guys ask a lot of questions. And I know you're going to have a lot of questions. I'm going to do my best to answer as, as honestly as I can. I do not have all the answers, but I will tell you up front that I believe there was both the hijackings. And, and that does not mean that I'm right and you're wrong. I believe there were both hijackings and a controlled demolition scenario. And I'll explain to you how the whole thing fits together. And you may disagree, and that's OK if you disagree with me. But I can tell you, but, but, I'll, but, but, when you, but when you hear what I have to say, you'll understand why I've reached this conclusion. So I believe both of them happened, OK? Um, and, I, and it's also very important for you to know that as the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 comes up, you, I mean, no, no offense, but you guys have no idea what actually happened. This is like so much, the lies are so much bigger than what you know. And it's so much deeper, and it's so much more tragic once you have the truth. So on that note, uh, let me just take you to, uh, I'm actually going to start, I'm going to move you a little bit ahead to remember when George Bush and, and uh, uh, it was, they were counting the votes in Florida. OK? I'm going to take you back to November of 2000. Uh, they had not yet declared that uh, George Bush had won the election. We, I was having uh, meetings with the no full knowledge and permission of the CIA with, the Iraq, with Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations on resuming the weapons inspections. It is very important for you to understand that country, this, this story with 9-11 also ties in deeply to what happened with Iraq. Mm -hmm. And contrary to everything you were told, the Iraqis were not resistant to weapons inspections. They had a comprehensive agenda. The CIA had already a comprehensive agenda for resolving the entire conflict without war at all. And it involved weapons inspections, cooperation with anti-terrorism, and uh, major financial contracts for US corporations, and oil. Uh, and this would be developed over a period of time. But we already had, by November of 2000, we already had an agreement with the Iraqi government. We had a framework agreement that was, at that point, it was undefined, not so well defined, and, and we had to make it defined. But they had already consented to all of these things. They wanted peace with us. And um, so by February of 2001, the Iraqis had agreed to offer, to invite the FBI to send a task force into Baghdad with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations and to make arrests of terror suspects. This is very important for you to understand. So this is like the, the background of what you have to know. Okay, in April of 2001, I was summoned to my, oh, this is already happening. The comprehensive peace framework, those discussions are already underway. And I am, at this point, the chief asset covering the Iraqi embassy and the Libya house, both of them, I do both of them, and Yemen and Syria and Egypt and Malaysia. But, yeah, but Iraq and Libya are my primary countries. And uh, so I'm a back channel, which means that the government, the U.S. government gives me messages to give the Iraqis, and then the Iraqis give me messages to give to Washington. So I know everything. Every single conversation is going through me. And I can tell you that in April of 2001, I was summoned to my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and he said he had a message for me to deliver to New York at the earliest possible convenience. 
And the message was this. We are looking for information on a conspiracy to hijack airplanes. We expect the target to be the World Trade Center. We think they're going to fly the airplanes into the World Trade Center. And uh, we want the Iraqis to provide any, it's called actionable intelligence. Actionable intelligence is a name, an airport hub, a flight number, something that's going to help us identify who they are, where they're meeting, who, what their nationalities are, anything like this. And he says, he gives me a message and he says, we want this information and I want you to tell the Iraqis that if they fail to give us this information and if it is later determined that they knew the information and they did not give it to us, then the United States is prepared to go to war with Iraq. Okay, this is April of 2001. Well, I went up to, to New York and I was very, we were in the middle of these great negotiations. We already had an invitation, from February of 2001, we had an invitation for the FBI to come to Baghdad. So I go up to New York, I'm very pleasant, I'm very polite. There's no reason to be nasty with these people, they want peace. I say, hey, could you please send a message to Baghdad? We'd like this information. If you come across anything, you know, you've all, Saddam had been one of our best sources on terrorism throughout the 1990s. Iraq hated terrorism because they believed that, um, they hated Islamic jihadis. He hate, I mean, he did. He, whether you like Saddam or not, whether you hate Saddam or not, he hated Islamic conservatives. He was convinced that they would take advantage of the, uh, the crumbling of authority in Baghdad under the sanctions and that they would then uh, try to overthrow, overturn his government and the poverty of the people from the, the sanctions would, would fuel this, this problem, would, would help overturn his government. So he wanted to help us at every turn keep these people fr you know, from, from becoming too powerful. Okay. And so we knew this. So when I go to New York in April of 2001, I'm very friendly. And I say, hey, look, you, could you send the message to Baghdad? Let them know we're looking for this. Thanks. And the message from the Iraqis in April of 2001 is, hey, send the FBI. We've already agreed to send the you can. We've already invited you to send the FBI. Come on. Tell them, just bring them on. Sure. Wow. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> okay. So I go back, to, Rich, I go back to, to Washington and I get a phone call from Richard Reese. Come down. Come down to my office. I want to hear what they said. I go down. I said, oh, I was real polite. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I gave the message. Sure, sure. He said, I didn't tell you to be nice. I told you to tell those. You, this is going to be on television, right? This is going to be like. Okay. Well, we'll be. Well, I'll, I'll soft pedal what he said. He was like, you, t you go back to, you stupid goddamn blankety, 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 blankety. I told you to tell those SOB, MFers, God, GD, blah, 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 screaming, circling me around his conference. I can, I'll never forget it. Circling his conference desk, ranting and raving, waving his arms around. He didn't do that very often. He's, he does not have that kind of personality. He's a very calm man, and he feels that if you're, if you're really angry at somebody, then the more calm you are, the more dangerous you are. That's CIA. He's old school CIA. Okay, so he's screaming now. And I go back, he's like, you go back to New York and you deliver the message exactly the way that I told you to deliver the message. And I said, well, Richard, I don't want them to think I'm threatening them because, you know, I'm a, I believe in, like, negotiations and conflict resolution. He said, no, no, I don't want them to think you are threatening them. And he said, I don't want them to think I am threatening them. I want you to tell them this threat of war originates at the highest level of government above the CIA director and above the Secretary of State, that it would be three men, President George Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and no one else. Those are the three people who are threatening war. And I want to be really clear about the message that I was ordered to give them. We demand that you turn over any actionable, any fragment of intelligence outlining a, a, a conspiracy involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center, if you withhold this information, if we discover that you have withheld this information and the attack occurs, then we will bomb you back to the Stone Age. 
You will be bombed harder than you've ever been bombed before. You will be destroyed. You cannot, you've never been hit the way we're going to hit you now. Okay. So, okay, so I went up and I delivered that message. This is May of 2001. In June and July, practically every single week, my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and I talked about 9-11. And it was very clear that the intelligence community was being prepped for two things. One, to expect airplane hijackings. Now, I have to be honest with you, because I know a lot of you are interested in the controlled demolition. They prepped us to expect the airplane hijackings. They told us about it. They tried, they demand, like my CIA handler demanded that Iraq had to give us this. And they, they d insisted that if, they, if it happened, there would be a war there would be dire consequences. Now, what you're going to see in my book, and I, we have more copies of my book outside. We can, we've got more, or more here, too. Um, the, 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 there was something else going on that summer that was really beautiful. This peace framework that we had been working on was, was magnificent. It was turning out just glorious for a peace dividend. The Iraqis were now offering the weapons inspections, which of course we, that we, the United States had very rigorous standards for the weapons inspections. Iraq was offering cooperation with anti-terrorism to allow the FBI to go in. And Iraq started to offer a lot more. A lot more came on the table. By the summer, by June and July of 2001, Iraq was offering the United States preferential contract. And I think about the economy today preferential contracts for the United States corporations on telecommunications, healthcare, hospital equipment, pharmaceuticals, transportation. Iraq offered to buy one million American manufactured automobiles every year for 10 years. Think of what that would have done to the economy. Think about non-dual use factory production. And all of this was because the CIA was like, you know, if we're going to give up these darn sanctions, we're going to we're going to <laughs> we're going to take a pound of flesh with it. They had no, into, you know, and whether you like the CIA or not, and most of you, 99% of you, don't like the CIA. I realize that, of course, but the CIA was doing what it's supposed to do, whether you like it or not. They were taking care of what is in the best interest of the United States government, with the best interest of the United States economy, and they were not going to let Iraq punish the United States. And I hated the sanctions. I was doing this because I hated the sanctions. I was doing it because I thought because they had destroyed education. They wiped out literacy in a single generation. They destroyed the hospitals and the healthcare system. Iraq performed the second heart transplant in the world. And we wiped them out. OK? Uh, 11,000 people died every month. By the end of 1996, 500,000 children had died of sanctions, and they only counted five-year-olds and younger. They didn't even count the six-year-olds, because the United Nations was holding back the numbers. And after that report in, at the, in December of 96, they stopped counting it. They, the United Nations never published another report on the deaths. So frequently, what you will hear is that only 500,000 children died, but in fact, they continued to die, and approximately one million children died. They were babies. What did, they weren't even alive when the first Gulf War happened. This was an offense against, you know, this is genocide. This is a mass genocide. So that's my motivation. But the CIA did not have my motivation. They were out to make sure that the United States was not going to be punished for what they had done. And I was like, and, and believe me, by this point, we just wanted to get rid of the sanctions. The Iraqis were like, if they'll get rid of the sanctions, you bet. We'll give them anything they want. So before 9-11, you could have had every single thing you possibly could dream of. And if the CIA could have thought of more to ask for, we would have. We would have asked for, it was shameless. Okay, so, so you have peace that's breaking out in the Middle East. You have the 9-11 warnings. And then in August of 2001, uh, we went into high mode, high activity mode. On all, I can tell you the exact day, uh, on August 2nd, and after I tell you this, I'll open it up to questions. Um, on August 2nd was the uh, Senate nomination hearings for Robert Mueller who, to head the FBI. He was going to be the FBI director. And I was on the phone with my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, and I said, there's not one single terrorism investigation this man hasn't thrown. He, 
Oops. <laughs> That's okay. He threw the nine. He threw the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. He threw Lockerbie, and I said this man should not be the FBI director when this next attack occurs. And Richard Fuse said to me, "My God, what if there is no FBI director when this happens?" I said, "Do you think it's that soon? Do you think the attack is imminent?" He said, "Oh yeah." He said, "It's absolutely just in the next couple of weeks." He said, this is, he said, I don't want, and I said, well, God, Richard, I'll go back to New York right now, and I'll get, I'll pump the Iraqis and see if they've got anything from Baghdad. I'll see if they have any news for us. And he said, oh, my God, Susan, don't go back to, do not go back to New York City. It's too dangerous. We are expecting a, the use of a miniature thermonuclear device. And they were not afraid that I was going to be hurt by like falling debris in the World Trade Center. I wasn't going to be at the World Trade Center. They were afraid of radiation contamination, like the winds blowing the radio radioactive stuff. And that's what they, he was like, don't go up there. We're expecting mass casualties. And I said, well, Richard, you know, I'll go up the, you know, the day after. This was a, I can tell you the exact day. It was a Thursday. And I said, I will go up to New York on Saturday and I'll report to you on Monday. And we'll just find out if the Iraqis have anything to give us. I went up to New York. The Iraqis said, Ain't got nothing. We don't know. We don't know anything about this. You keep telling us about this. The only way we know about it is because you're talking about it. But we don't have any information to give you. And if we did, we understand the consequences. We know that if we don't help you, you're going to go to war with us if you think we did. And we, if there was anything we could give you, we would do it. So I go back and I report that on August 6th. On August 6th, there is a memo to the president telling him that this is a high security threat, that it is an emergency level, that it's imminent. Okay. I, at my meeting with Richard Fuse, Richard Fuse tells, does something very important. He tells me that because of my direct contacts with Iraq and Libya, I should be the one, I am perfectly positioned, because everyone likes to think that Iraq and Libya are involved in terrorism to begin with, I should be the one to contact U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft's office, and I should tell them that we're looking for an what's called an emergency broadcast alert across all agencies seeking any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center identified specifically. And I, call, I make that phone call. Uh, that, that con my conversation was refused is August 6th. Probably August 7th, August 8th, I call them. And immediately I talk to the, pri I have a private phone number. See, huh, you guys couldn't get this number, but I have it, okay? I have the number inside the Attorney General's office. I'm not calling a switchboard. I'm calling his private staff, okay? I'm calling his, like, his, his government liaison office. His, his, you know, no, no, let me, no, that's not true. I call his private internal office. There are about 20 members of his private staff. His legislative director is there. His government relations person is there. But I call inside that office. And they give me the, office for the, the phone number for the Office of Counterterrorism. They say, repeat exactly what you just told us and tell them. I am told that John Ashcroft said, oh, those CIA people keep talking about terrorism. And they keep talking about this darn airplane hijacking and they're so paranoid and why do they keep bugging us about it? That's what I'm told they said. <laughs> uh, but I did what I did. And when I did that, I apparently tripped some wires because it denied the White House, it denied the Justice Department and the Attorney General's office of deniability, plausible deniability. And that's very important. And that is why they came after me so hard and tried to destroy me utterly, because they could not admit to you that we had absolutely anticipated this thing. We knew it was going to happen exactly as it did go down, with one exception. And here's where I just, and then I'm, I'm going to finish this, and then I'll open the floor to questions. Um, the, uh, what, what, it, what I have learned since then, now all the things that I've told you are things I did directly. So I'm telling you, I'm not relating what somebody else did or a conversation that somebody else had that has been reported to me. This is direct primary knowledge from my own experience. 
but what I'm going to tell you now is from somebody else, okay? And so I, I distinguish these two things. I have been told that some, by somebody who saw the videos that at the World Trade Center, on approximately, from approximately August 23rd, and it could have been August 22nd, it could have been August 24th, okay, approximately August 23rd until approximately September 3rd, and again, it could be September 2nd. The spooks can be weird about this stuff. Okay, they could say, well, there, it wasn't September 4th. So no. No, it could have been September 3rd, okay? It could have been September 2nd. Right in, within a couple of days of this, my friend says that between the, at, at, at approximately 3 o'clock in the morning, strange vans, and there were just maybe three of them, he said, that not just a couple. The way he put it was a couple of vans. So we're thinking three, possibly four, but most likely three. A couple of vans arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning after the janitorial trucks had left the building. And it's very important because they were able to identify the vans according to make, model, color, and uh, there were no markings on the vans. But the janitorial vans did have markings. And so they were able to distinguish that these are not the same vans. And they know how the janitorial trucks left the building and the, they actually tracked the paths that the janitorial trucks took to drive home. Like the janitorial workers were driving down certain roads to get over to, to their houses, and the CIA, or the FBI, the NSA folks tracked those people home. Um, and they're they're, he was quite convinced that these are not the same trucks. And between the hours of 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, these trucks had never been in this building before. It was an anomaly. Definitely, it wasn't like it was going on for months and months and it just continued. They showed up for 10 days, 10 or 11 days approximately, then they were never seen again. And that's when they believe they wired the building. And they do believe, and, and, and my friend told me absolutely it was a thermite bomb, a thermite bomb with, a, it was a thermite bomb with a potential sulfur in it. The sulfur it makes it, uh, it is a, uh, the, 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 the important thing about a thermite bomb is it is, a, it is a, an extraordinary heat-reducing bomb. Okay, it, it, it's, it, creates, it takes steel and it creates molten steel. So it takes beams of steel and it turns it into molten steel. And it just rot, everything underneath just sinks into the ground like what you saw. And it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is a special U.S. military-grade weapon. Okay? It is a military-grade weapon. It's not something you could make ever in your kitchen or your, or your garage or your, or your living room. It is impossible for you to do this. This is a U.S. military weapon. And so I, uh, I do believe that that helps to explain uh, some, of the, the missing, some of the missing pieces. And I believe this is what happened. Uh, they had known in it, they'd known about the terrorist attack for months. There is a long-term advanced knowledge. Assets are being watched. The, 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 terror, the so-called terrorists, whether you want to think of them as re whether, whether they're real, Mohammed Atta was an asset trained by the United States government, supervised by the United States government. And I can assure you that assets, and I'm speaking directly from my own personal experience, assets are heavily controlled individuals. I was never dealing with Iraq and Libya without somebody paying extremely close attention to me at every stage, and my phones were tapped. I mean, at some point, they, they, had, they had wired my house. <laughs> when they had the handover of the two Libyan men, I went down to my basement the same day that they handed over the men, and my ceiling of my basement had been torn out, and there were cable wires dangling from the ceiling, about a dozen cable wires. And I had a contractor come over to my house and he said, wow, you really, somebody really put a kick-ass stereo system in your house. That's amazing. He said, you have, you have these wires going to every single room of your house, even in your bathroom. And I was like, oh, you know. But yeah, but he, he was like, they, he said, it's everywhere. He said, you must have like a stereo system that just, you know, rocks in this house. Um, but... So anyway, but the point is, is that assets, they, they, there's no way that these assets could have functioned without everyone knowing every single detail of what they were doing. There's no way they could have hidden. They could not have disguised their actions from their handlers. 
Even if they tried to disguise it, it wouldn't work. Believe me, it wouldn't work. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, you know, no, it's impossible. Impossible. And so it's more likely that they were using Muhammad Atta to guide the conspiracy, to track the conspiracy, and then they discovered that they were bozo pilots, they were clowns, they weren't any good at this flying stuff, and now they had an agenda. And the agenda was that when this attack happened, they were going to go to war with Iraq. But, oh gosh, we've got a problem now. Because the problem is they're not going to be able to do the job. Uh-oh. Oh, what a bummer. We're not going to be able... If, if, see, see, here's the thing about all... And I'm speaking now, for, again, from experience. The 1993 World Trade Center attack killed five people. The, the bombing of the USS Coal killed 12 people. And once the smoke and clears and the catastrophe, the chaos is over and the noise is done, it's pretty, you know, it's like, it's, it's all, there's not a lot of damage that would just, that would certainly not enough that would allow a government, a pro-war cabal, to throw itself into a new war with Iraq, which they wanted to do. They'd already decided to do it. And so, that is the motivation. There can, the thing is, there can never be a, any police officer will tell you, there is no crime without a motive and opportunity. And we had both. So it's not like they just spontaneously wired the World Trade Center. They knew it was coming, and they wanted to make sure that they had maximum damage when it hit. They knew they were going to use the airplanes as the cover to demolish the building. So it's not, you know, a lot of people in the 9-11 truth community have gotten kind of, at first, when I first broke this news, they were like, you know, a lot of people attacked me, and they said, you're saying there were airplane hijackings. No, no, there was a demolition. And I'm like saying, no, no, there's both of it. Both things happened. They, they knew this, they knew the airplanes were going to be hijacked, so they used it as a cover for the, to, to guarantee maximum destruction because they already knew the consequence of war. So, there you have it. <laughs> sure. And, and, okay, yeah. I forget what you said that your job was, your go-between. Your... Uh, I was a, what's called an asset. Right, okay. I, I was an intelligence asset. I was supervised by handlers for the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency. I was not covert. This is very, I was covert from your end. Like you guys, the American people had no idea that Clinton, President Clinton had opened up a back channel because they didn't want you all to know this. But in fact, the, from the very first meetings that I have at the Iraqi embassy and the Libyan embassy, they were told who I was. They knew that I was a, a passionate anti-sanctions activist and passionately anti-war. I hated the first Gulf War, had protested the Gulf War, and uh, I wanted to do anything that I could to try to create a communications. They couldn't have a formal communications because of the sanctions. They were officially on the pariah list, and yet they had to have some kind of communications and discussion in order to, res in order to on terrorism specifically. So my question is, um, you were a back channel between everybody. I, I, I find it odd that your boss doesn't talk to the people in the administration. Oh, they did. They send you over there to yell at people. Well, they, no, no, or they, tell them I, I think that he did. I, I know that he did. So I know that he did. What, what, what he did, what he did was, uh, I believe, I believe, and I could be wrong about this, but I believe that he contributed to the White House memo on uh, the, 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 the presidential directive, instruction, request. <laughs> there's, a, there's a formal term for that. I'm afraid I don't know what it is. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. He did contribute to that, and he had vastly more information than I did. I was getting all my knowledge from him. But the fact that we needed some, we needed fast turnaround on this because we thought the attack was within a couple of weeks. In fact, the attack didn't occur for another... This was August 6th, and it occurred over a month later. But we thought that the attack could come as early as, you know, the third or fourth week of August. We thought it was imminent. And so, well, he, he probably did also. Everybody was doing it. See, this is the thing that, I mean, not, no offense, but there was so much discussion about this attack. 
Everybody was talking about it. George Tenet had some meetings. Other, other analysts had meetings at the White House that Condoleezza Rice has like conveniently pretended didn't happen. Um, but there, there, was a, there was a lot of knowledge. And, and the fact that I would be able to get the Attorney General's attention, the staff attention, by saying I'm in direct contact with Iraq. That's kind of like a, that's like a bona fide thing that in the CIA. That's like a, they call it bona fide. Yeah, exactly. We were, we were, and it wasn't like a supervisory thing at that point. They wanted someone with direct contact, because I had direct contact with the events, and I could cite that and say, you need to listen to me, because I speak with the, I spoke with the Iraqis on Saturday, and I need to tell you this. I spoke, you know, you see what I mean? So that's, I'm sure he also did, I'm, I know he did other things too. Okay. Um, in the course of your talk, what I haven't heard is any real evidence that there was a genuine uh, jihadi plot. Um, maybe that's in your book, but you haven't uh, said anything to show me that uh, such a plot existed. In fact, the impression I get from the evidence that you presented about what your bosses were talking about and what was going on in the US government is that the US government was um, trying to create a predictive um, situation yes. with this attack. Yes. Um, which, in my opinion, could well have been the sum and substance of the attack. And that, um, you know, as I said, I haven't seen anything that you said that shows me that there was a genuine jihadi uh, plot. Uh, you know, this is a very good question because. <laughs> it's really questionable that there was a jihadi plot. I do believe there were hijackers. Now, I, I have to tell you that I do believe there were hijackers. On the other hand, I know that they were the people that they did identify were assets. Okay, they worked for the United States government, and they were the men who did who were identified as the 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 uh, the, the hijackers were not jihadis. They were not devoutly religious men. Uh, they went to strip clubs. They drank alcohol. They dr smoked cigarettes. They chased women. Real, real deep, authentic jihadis would do none of that. They, they were, you know, and, and so the, it's really curious to me as to what their, I, I, and I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately, but what their final minutes must have been on this earth. What did they think they were doing? I, I truly do not know. I don't know if they thought it was just a training exercise. I don't know if they thought, I, I just don't know. But I don't think, I do not believe they were jihad, real jihadis. One other point. You, you, said, you say that um, there was a point in midsummer um, 2001 when the CIA and uh, elements in the US government became, may have become concerned that uh, having planned this event, for it that the uh, alleged jihadi pilots weren't going to be able to uh, accomplish the goal. Yeah. Well, now, according to the official version of 9-11, they did accomplish the goal of flying the airplanes into the buildings. And so um, do you think that the CIA made a mistake and underestimated the well, talent of these pilots? Well, well, no, well, well here's the thing. Um, they, they did fly into the building. Of course, they did. And they could have been on automatic pilot. That makes sense. Um, we know that there was a heightened GPS and heightened cell phone activity um, that, that is very unusual. Uh, usually, the, the GPS only works to, uh, it, it doesn't work at certain altitudes. And at a scale of like 1 to 10, the GPS signal was working at a 10, whereas ordinarily it might work at a 4. See? And so something was helping boost, and, and it had to be boosted. It, could not have, it couldn't have just spontaneously done this on its own. Something had to be boosting the GPS signal. 
And that's, and it's just a, a matter of scientific requirement that it had to be boosted, and it was. Um, the cell phone was the same thing. I, you know, some people have tried to say that the cell phone conversations did not happen. I do believe they did happen. I do believe that people got through to their, their spouses. But again, you see that it had to be some, uh, there had to be some, 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 some technological boost for it to be done. And I think that they got, the hijackers got a lot of help. They got a lot of help. Uh, oh. My general view, and this is sort of what I'm asking, is uh, I, that's what I thought actually happened, was it was both, you know, the planes and the demolition bomb. Yeah. Uh, but without a lot of information, that's just what seemed to make sense. What, uh, if you consider, the problems I'm having, if you consider books like Russ Baker's Family Secrets, yeah. yes. uh, Andy yes. Jacobson's Area 51, that yes. just came out recently. Mm -hmm. And the last one I just read was uh, Naomi Wolf's uh, The End of America. Yes. And, um, Good, yeah. Well, I mean, it's just so random. So how can you expect us, uh, knowing the corruption uh, of moral character is what I believe what it is. I, I think fundamentally where we're at is a spiritual crisis, and in, in essence, the big picture. Yeah. And so I'm sort of interested in you in, in, in part of that, because I, I'm sure there are people that are dedicated in the CIA that are very trustworthy. Well, you know? I mean, well, I'm trustworthy yeah. in the sense that their, their motivations are clear. But I think um, overall, considering all the torture and the long history that it's had, and you can't believe anything. Basically, you can't. You just don't know. There's so much spin with it. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying there's not dedicated individuals. I think there are. I sure. I think everybody's sure. black and white. Sure. So, what I'd like to get from you in part is, is first of all, your picture of the, the big overall, what's What's the primary motive of the war? But who, I mean, what is the big picture? Who are the, the big <laughs> honchos at the top that are mm -hmm. directing? Well, I, I, I'd like to answer this on a couple of levels. Um, first of all, uh, the CIA has a long track record of, of doing a false flag operations on itself. Um, and, and one of the reasons that I uh, may be more trustworthy is that I have a, uh, I was, uh, n I was an asset, not, an, not uh, a CIA director. My CIA handler received $13 million tax-free. Didn't even have to pay a dollar in taxes. Is that not the sweetest thing you've ever heard in your life? From the 9-11 investigation of emergency appropriations that were attended for the Iraq, Iraq to secure Iraq's cooperation. And he took the money, and you've never heard him speak, and he, when, when I was under indictment, my own CIA handler refused to speak to my attorneys for five years. If he had spoken to my attorneys at, one, at any time at all, we could have ended my indictment entirely. But the other thing is, is that I was, the reason you should trust me is because I paid for this. <laughs> I was locked up in prison on a military base for a year. And I was held under indictment for five years. And they were, so, the government was so, if you do a little research on my story, you'll find the government was so threatened by what I was going to say that they actually argued to, for, this, is in the, this, this is like a record. There's a history of this. You can confirm this. They, they, they wanted to forcibly drug me with Haldol, Ativan, and Prozac, which would have chemically lobotomized me because they said that I was, uh, they, they admitted that I was not hallucinating. I did not, do not suffer depression. Uh, for those of you who do suffer depression, sorry, but I don't. Um, I don't have mood disturbances. They said I had good eye contact. I was cooperative, smiling. There was, they could not identify anything wrong with me except that I argued that I had, that I, my defense was I had worked in anti-terrorism for nine years and I warned about 9-11 and my team warned about 9-11. And they were like, they were not, they, they, they tried to uh, detain me up to 10 years. They actually petitioned the court for the right on the Patriot Act for the right to detain me up to 10 years in prison with no trial and no hearing. Imagine that. 
The government is arguing that we don't have to give this woman a hearing. We can just lock her up indefinitely. And I was the test case on this, and it was horrible. And, and they wanted to for lock me up and forcibly drug me at the same time so that I would be so destroyed. They told the judge that they had no idea how long my cure, my cure, was going to take, but they wanted it. Uh, the judge in my case was Michael Mukasey. Michael Mukasey later became U.S. Attorney General, and I fought so hard, and my beloved companion, sweet, wonderful Jay Fields, who, is, who died of cancer, unfortunately, never lived to see me exonerated. Uh, he fought in the blogs, and he fought on alternative radio, because the corporate media refused to cover my story. They would not, they didn't want to tell you what was going on. Um, they, they said that they, they implied very strongly that I was a religious maniac. And, and I do believe in God. And I have a spiritual life. Yes, I do. But I'm not, a, I'm not a religious maniac. I guess a religious maniac would be someone like the Elizabeth Smart uh, rapist, kidnapper, who went into court and was like spouting religious stuff and was singing up him, standing up and singing hymns in court, stuff like that. They wanted me to... Yeah, yeah. It was, and, and when, they, when they realized that um, the, yeah, when they, they there was actually a, I call it my Amnesty International moment. Uh, they had already, uh, the, the Justice Department had already petitioned to forcibly drug me, and I was waiting for a decision. And one morning I was in, I was locked up in prison at this, at this point. Uh, I had been held on Carswell Air Force Base for eight months, and then I was moved to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York for four months. And one morning, they, at 5.30 in the morning, I, the, the guard wakes me up, he shakes me, he said, you're going to court today. And I'm like weeping. I'm thinking that they've got the decision and they're going to like send me back to Carswell to be drugged and I'm hysterical. I was absolutely hysterical. And I get into the courtroom and, and my, my, I'm in a holding cage that's about the size of this table. And they, and they come in, my attorney comes in and he says, oh my God, someone has started a blog on your case and people are writing your judge. They're writing Judge Mukasey, you gotta tell your friend to stop doing this. I was like, never, no, <laughs> no way. And I was like, and I was like, we are, ne and literally I grabbed the bars, I was like, we are never gonna stop. You are, we are gonna fight to defend this constitution. You are breaking the law and we are never going to shut up until this is done. You, you can tell that crooked prosecutor that he can just go to hell because we're going to keep talking until, the, you know, you're never going to shut me up now. <laughs> you know, this was a mistake. <laughs> this was a huge mistake that they did this to me. Um, and we went in and the judge was like, you know, so. And at that point, the, uh, Jay had published psych records. When, when I, after my arrest, I had been ordered to have uh, attend, we, this actually saved me. Uh, I, I had been ordered to attend weekly psychology meetings. Uh, I had never had any psychological problems and I had a year's worth of documentation saying that I suffered no mental illness, no depression, no psychosis, no mania, no nothing, no mood disturbances. And, and these are in the back of my book so you can actually look at this stuff for yourself and you can see the papers with your own eyes. And you can read them. And, and, he, and he, the judge was like, well, this is extraordinary. You're telling me this woman is incompetent and she's suffering from this grave mental illness, and yet she has the, all these records which are on the bloody internet. Why are these papers not in my courtroom? And the judge was like, uh-uh, this is just not going to happen. And at that point, I was saved. Because the judge was like, this is, this is, this, you know, this is, this woman is not cooperative. You know, if I had been cooperative, you know, they would have done it. If I had been passive, they would have done it. But I mean, I'm a fighter, and they still wouldn't give me a hearing. And I mean, I know how to fight. I'm an activist and an asset. Believe me, I know how to fight. And they would, and it was like the Patriot Act was so hideous, so big, so powerful, that there, there was nothing that they were going to let it break through. But Judge Mukasey also did the financial case on the 9-11, the insurance claims for 9-11 for Larry Silverstein, who went to his synagogue. They both attend the same synagogue. Yeah. Cozy. Cozy. Very cozy. If Muhammad Atta willingly 
sacrifice himself, or didn't he know what was going to happen to him? I do not know. I do not know. If, see, I wonder about all these things because I wonder if they thought that it was like a, a practice, or if they thought, you know, they, this was just like I, I don't. I do not know the answer to that. It's like it's fascinating to think what they must have thought. Oh. There were foreign newspapers that reported that um, many of the hijackers are still alive. Yes. Um, I think six or seven of them were reported. One is a pilot for the um, Saudi Arabian Airlines. I believe one lives in Los Angeles. Um, so there was all this, and then there was the report. That's that true. Mohammed. Yes. Uh, so, so it doesn't make sense that there were these hijackers that hijacked pla hijacked planes. I mean, obviously, something is wrong with this story. Yeah. If these people are still alive. I well, I wonder though if it was those. Yeah. I I I don't I don't have as an asset. Um, this may frustrate. This is probably going to frustrate you. I'm trained to stop where I like. I have. It's very much compartmentalized. And there are certain things that I know from my own direct personal experience that I can tell you. And then there are other things that I I'm taught just to say to draw a line. And it may drive you crazy, but there are some things that I cannot answer because I don't know. And as an asset, I'm told to stop and to always to distinguish what I actually know from what I don't know. And that's one of the things I don't know. Sorry. Well, but, but I do believe there were hijackings. But to hold on to the story that there were hijackings. Well, I, I, and then I, I do believe. the hijackers alive. I don't know. Well, but, but, the, but we don't necessarily know who the hijackers we were. We also have other information that some of the serial numbers of the planes were um, uh, located several years later as the planes are still in existence. So there's, there's a lot of, like, very, very strange. Very strange. There's a lot of strange. And then, then yeah, that yeah. plane that went down in Pennsylvania with no plane parts. That was no shot down. No plane parts anywhere. Yeah. There was a plane that was shot down, and I know that the, there was a pilot who shot down one of the airplanes. And uh, he is locked up in prison in Florida right now. What's his name? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I, I, I could get it for you. I will get it for you. Uh, I've been. I'm sorry. I've been told his name before, and I'm actually doing a radio interview with Michael Herzog tomorrow, who's the one who told me about the guy. And I will get that information, and I will get, pass it to uh, our friend over here, and, and we'll get that to you. Because he needs help. The last I heard, he was still in. Uh, he, it could be that I hope he's been released. But the last, and if he, and he may have been released by now, but the last I heard he was still in prison, and if he is still in prison, it would be awfully nice if you guys could help him. Who's, who's to gain, who's to lose? Well, I, I believe, I mean, the, the tragedy was that it was so, it, it, before 9-11 ever happened, they already knew about this peace framework, and they already knew that they could have the United States would receive no punishments at all uh, for, or no punishments, they, they, very, they, they would, not, would not face any problems because of the years of support for the sanctions. The Iraqis wanted the sanctions off so badly that they were going to give the United States everything that they could have wanted. So this is even going on before 9-11 happens. And they were going to give them, you know, one million American-made automobiles every year, uh, telecommunications, that would be satellites, phone, TV, every, you know, the, the CIA could have been, you know, snooping through all the Middle East phone conversations. It was crazy what they, what they lost. Uh, Health care, hospital equipment, pharmaceuticals, uh, just, just on and on. Just amazing things. So oil. <laughs> yeah, they could have had everything, even oil. And the only group that wasn't going to benefit was the military industrial complex because this would have been peace this would have been a very prosperous peace believe me the CIA was driving a hard bargain anything that we could think to add I mean and, and I have to say again I'm anti sanctions so I know that a lot of people would say well that's not fair to do to the Iraqis and I agree with you <laughs> I agree with you but it was what the CIA wanted, and they were going to have every single thing that they could think to get. And uh, they wanted, and, and at the same time, we all knew that it would have to be tremendous to appease George Bush, because he was out for, you know, the Daddy Bush fantasy, this delusion. It was a delusion. But the one group that was not going to benefit was the military-industrial complex. And they were going to be the big losers in this whole thing. 
They were not going to be able to have their wars. They were not going to be able to sell their military weapons systems. The $400 billion, we wouldn't need all the, for this equipment or that equipment. They wouldn't need any of it. And so they were the losers, and, and they were just too powerful. You know? Okay, this isn't actually a question, but a brief comment. Okay. Uh, we were talking about the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Flight 93 uh, crash, alleged crash. Yeah. And I just want to say that uh, anyone can claim to have, any pilot could claim to have shot down the airliner. That's easy to claim something like that, but it did happen. And I just want to point out that not only was there no plane debris at the alleged crash site, but neither was there a debris field anywhere else. And we know from incidents like Lockerbie that when a plane blows uh, over land, it leaves a debris field. But there was yeah. no debris field uh, uh, to be shown. Uh, so well, it's also it's also, Pentagon, it's also the Pentagon. It's also the Pentagon. I do not believe that the Pentagon uh, was uh, hit by an airplane. I mean. They're, they're saying they, 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 all that debris suddenly was magically just removed. <laughs> you know, there was no airplane there either. So it, it's, you know, there's still a lot of questions about 9-11 that I cannot answer for you, and I'm sorry. I wish I, you know, these are good questions you're asking. And it's not like I'm trying to blow you off. There's just some things I don't know. But hopefully I'm going to give you enough new information that you'll be able to, like, put some more pieces of it together. Your um, compartmentalized structure of the, the uh, agency, yeah. and uh, and I think that's pretty well understood. How uh, uh, one person can be sitting here working on a project, the next person's there, and they can't. You know, they're not allowed to really to look at what the other one's doing. Yes. Um, in light of that, I, I think you're probably aware that that it's been documented there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 military drills running on 9-11. Yes. That is absolutely unprecedented. Uh -huh. uh, not only that, September 10th was, to not 12. only that, there was there was one drill that was specifically on the on a on a hijacking that <laughs> exactly the scenario that we're mm -hmm. told uh, transpired. And it's uh, you've probably you've probably studied uh, Webster Griffin Tartley's analysis of this 9-11 synthetic chair made in USA, uh, how he breaks this down very uh, convincingly, I believe, that mm -hmm. the operation was conduited through the drills. Mm -hmm. and, and certain people were doing certain things and maybe, probably, likely didn't even know that they were involved in an operation this day. Yes. And couldn't share information because of this compartmentalization. And I'm just wondering if you've had an opportunity to talk af you know, after all of your ordeal with any other, anybody else who was able to confirm any of this. Well, I, well, I, I will tell you that, um, that the 9-11 conspiracy is based on something called Project Bojinka. And are you all familiar with Project Bojinka? OK, Bojinka was designed by. Uh, by Ramzi Youssef, who was the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center attack. And he conceived that 11, in his grand scheme, 11 airplanes would be hijacked and would strike different targets all over the United States. The World Trade Center would be one, but the, and then they would hit the White House, they'd hit the Justice Department, they'd also hit like Chicago, they'd hit Los Angeles, and throughout the whole country there'd be strikes. And, um, the military discovered this when they found, or the, the, the CIA discovered this when they arrested uh, Ramzi Youssef in the Philippines in 1995, and they found the, the, the blueprint for this 9-11, what became the 9-11 attack, on his computer. Okay, and, they, and he called it Project Bojinka. And at that point, the military began to run uh, simulated uh, counter strategies for what you would do if there was an airplane hijacking scenario that was attacking various targets throughout the United States. And one of the targets was the Pentagon. 
And then the Pentagon said it was too outrageous that anybody, nobody would actually attack the Pentagon this way. So maybe they should drop the Pentagon scenario. So they did. But even though they had rehearsed Project Bojinka, on 9-11, uh, on September 10th through September 12th, NORAD was on high alert on doing military exercises uh, because this, allegedly the, the former Soviet Union, the Russians, were doing their military exercises. So we timed our military exercises allegedly to theirs. And they were supposed to be on heightened alert just in, in the course of practice. They were supposed to be on heightened alert for any invasion of sovereignty of airspace, sovereign airspace, on those dates. And yet, even though the military was on high alert, they took no action when the, uh, when the airplanes were hijacked and, and, they, they, and, and they didn't scramble, they didn't do any, they broke all of their own protocols. <laughs> but weren't they mostly sent up in, in directions? Yeah. Away from the there you go. Board? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. And they sent one jet. They turned one jet around and sent it after one fighter to go track they down. They were already on drills and, and exercises that had already taken them out and basically left the eastern seaboard. Yes. And yes. this is supposed to be the smartest military in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. And 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 they and yeah, exactly. Well there was embarrassment. You know, putting someone into prison or something like this. Yeah, well, the, other than me and 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 the and the guy who who was uh, who was allegedly flying the the plane that was involved in the 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 nine, high, shooting down 93, who they don't want you to know about, who's been you know who was held in prison for a couple of years at least, and I don't know if he's out or not. I mean, they gave him a real hard time, so. Yeah. Susan, could you remind me again what the sanctions were for in Iran? And two questions. And then I just wanted to get clear about what you were arrested for. Good. Um, the sanctions were on uh, to punish Iraq for allegedly having weapons of mass destruction. And they said that Iraq would, they would keep the sanctions on Iraq until all weapons of mass destruction were confirmed to have been destroyed. Now, it appears that they were actually destroyed by the end of 96 or 97, but the United States was, you know, had an ulterior agenda, which was they were not going to let go of the sanctions until uh, Saddam was out of power. But what had happened was, by the year 2000, while Bill Clinton was still in office, the international loathing for sanctions had become intense. Two million people had died from sanctions. Uh, what, between 1.7 million and 2.2 million had died. Uh, and, the, and the international community was violating the sanctions. The German pilots were filed, and Jordanian pilots were filed, and actually it was coming from all over Europe. Germany was the first, and they had pilots fly humanitarian supplies over the air, through sovereign airspace, and land at Baghdad airport, and then a whole bunch of other countries followed suit, and they were all like, we're, we're not going to do this. This is wrong, it is immoral, it is a crime against humanity, and we recognize that. And so at that point, the CIA, I, I wanted to do it, but at that point, the CIA knew that they were losing control of the situation, and that they better step in and do something. And I, I, I wanted to end the sanctions, so I was glad the pilots were doing this. But the CIA was very, very expedient. It was politically expedient. They, had they were losing control of the situation. They wanted to take back their power. I was arrested for, uh, I was arrested, uh, I was accused of several things. One, I was accused of acting as an unregistered Iraqi agent because I had delivered a letter to my cousin who was the chief of staff to George Bush telling him that the war in Iraq would be catastrophic and begging him uh, and, and outlining several of the consequences like democracy would throw power to Islamic fundamentalists and there would be a rise of terrorist attacks and the Iraqi people hated the sanctions and they would hate America for having done all this and if they could get their hands on America, they, 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 it, would be, it would just be a very ugly, brutal occupation uh, and they'd fight us. That was my letter. I went to jail for that. But, uh, but, and they also accused me of, of uh, they called it unlawful financial transactions. Uh, I was accused, I'm not making this up, of eating, allegedly eating three lunch, I'm not making this up, 
three lunches with Iraqi diplomats totaling $92.92. We have the receipts. <laughs> and uh, they brought criminal, they called that a felony. Uh, I was accused of, of uh, I had, there were secret charges against me, uh, which we have deduced. We, we were never allowed to know what they were. See, on the Patriot Act, let, let me just tell you a little bit, because I think this is a good opportunity to explain. When I was indicted, under the Patriot Act, they're allowed to have secret charges and secret evidence and secret grand jury testimony. This is very much, the Patriot Act is modeled on the pretty much verbatim, in many page, page upon page, identical to the uh, old communist criminal, let's see, I guess it's the Soviet, let's see, there, there's, a, there's a long name for it, the Soviet Criminal Act, which set up the KGB apparatus and allowed people to make false, accu make accusations against their neighbors without identifying themselves. And it set up the whole gulag system. And the, the Patriot Act is modeled on that Soviet law. The Soviet Criminal Act, and it's you know ver almost verbatim to what that is. So I mean th this is a this is a really scary scary law. But I was accused of like possibly in the secret charges. One of the, we believe the secret charges was that I received a book, a book from the Iraqis that was a book on depleted uranium, and that was considered classified because if we were to tell American soldiers about the health risks and the rise of cancer rates and birth defects, then it might demoralize American soldiers. Okay? And another thing was is that Saddam's government tried, I'm not making this up, another secret charge was that I, we believe, well, because I know what I was doing in the periods when I, of these like different, they, they, they'd have a date, and I would know approximately what I was doing on that date. And so another one was that, uh, 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 the Iraqis tried to give the Bush administration several hundred thousand dollars in campaign contributions so that in the, during the presidential election because they wanted to show that they wanted to be friends with America. And I was ordered, I had reported that to my defense intelligence handler. He was like, holy shit, you got to tell the Iraqis not to do this. You got to make them not do this. And because it, would, it reminded them all of the Asian fundraising crisis under Clinton. And he said, don't they watch from C-SPAN? Don't they know they're not supposed to do this? And he said, he said, you go back and you tell them that if we, if we find out they gave money to the Republican Party in this campaign, we're going to bomb them. We're gonna, you know, but, but, but see, at this point, Iraq had been bombed so many times, you couldn't threaten them with bombing anymore because they'd already been attacked. What, how are you going like, to impress on people who, oh, you're going to bomb us again? OK. Sure. <laughs> you know. So. Can I rewind to uh, sure. earlier in your talk? But, uh, I just wanted to know how you knew what the, uh, that Mohammed Atta was a CIA uh, asset? That's, that's been very well established. This, they, they've admitted that he was a CIA asset. So could you send me to like, a reference or something so I would be able to uh, verify that? Can you um, um, find something? I, I, I will find a reference for you and, and, and give it to these guys. And, and Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll get I'll get you some references on that, but but it has been verified that he was, uh, and he received some military training too. Sorry. So, you know, I look on the audience here. We're pretty old. Do you go to your? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. I'm sorry. Do you go to universities or high schools or because you know young people can steer things up, you know. And, do some major changes, you know? Do you do that, or they say, no, you can well, do Well, actually, I've really just started doing this because my book came out just six months ago. And so I've done a lot of radio, and I've done a lot of blogging, and which is more youth, I guess, more younger. I don't know if that's not fair. That's not really fair to say that it's younger people. But, um, but I do a lot of, a lot of radio and, and a, lot of, you know, people, a lot of new media stuff. Uh, I'd, I would love to. I would love to do that. I would love to do that um, if I can get. If there's, this is really my first kind of book tour. <laughs> so, uh, but I would love to go to college campuses. I'm just kind of figuring out how to do it, because part of the problem is, is the corporate media will not cover my story at all. Even when I was locked up in prison, 
Um, my favorite, one of my favorite stories, I know you guys all love Amy Goodman, but Amy Goodman told my, uh, yeah, Amy Goodman, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you got you to gotta hear what she did to me. When I was locked up, my boyfriend called her and talked to her producers and said, please, you know, Susan is the, chi the cousin of the chief of staff to the president. She covered the Iraqi embassy. She warned about 9-11. She's locked up on a military base on the Patriot Act, and they're refusing to give her a hearing. And she was the chief asset covering Iraqi pre-war intelligence. The government is saying that she's incompetent, and they're saying that, the, that assets were incompetent. And yet she's accused, and he gave her the letter, the Andy Card letter, and said, you know, she wrote this letter, and, and, and she turned out it was right on all fronts. And, couldn't you please interview her? Couldn't you do a story? Please help us. And she, you know what she did? She said, well, you know, maybe her attorney thinks this is a good strategy. We wouldn't want to upset things for settling the case. She'd been told, she'd been told to stay away from the story. Yeah, yeah, but you know, she did. She took it, she did it herself, and she's to blame for it. And I will tell you, I will never forgive Amy Goodman for that. And my boyfriend was like in tears. He was, he was weeping. I mean, he's a military, he was a military, he was a retired Navy guy. And you guys, you know, Navy guys don't, I mean, you, you know men, you know, he's like, a, some men don't cry. He cried. He, he broke down in tears. And you know, men is hard for some time. For some men, not all men, some men cry. I know that, but he did. He was really upset, and he was just like, she won't do this, and he was just like heartbroken. And he was heartbroken for me, and he was just like, and I was locked up in prison at the time, and I'm on the prison phone, what, what, the, what the fuck do you mean Amy Goodman won't do this? How could she do, how could she not think this is the right story? What did you say to her to make her not do this story? And he was like, I don't know, I don't know, I told her. I said, did you say this and this and this? And he said, yeah. So. Yeah, I heard you on the Jeff Friends program last week. Oh, last week. on Libya. On Libya. <clears throat> so that's very similar, isn't it, to what's happening in Iraq? There is no reason for the United States to be invading Libya at all. There is no justification for this. Uh, we are, it's ironic because we're support, we're fighting Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and Iraq. And Libya is, a, is, a, is actually, the Libyan rebels are radical Islamists who are trying to institute Sharia. And whether you like Sharia or whether you like the Islam, whether you, whether you like Qaddafi or not, see this is where it gets you, you're an asset. Whether you like Qaddafi, you may hate him, you may think he's bad, but the facts are that, that the rebels are Islamic radicals. They do want to institute Sharia and at least be honest and say it. Because that's what you're going to get. And don't pretend you're somewhere else. Don't pretend these are people who, you, who are doing something different than what you say. That is what their goal is. And they don't want democracy. They're going to, Gaddafi is, has been in power for 41 years, and I know it's time for change, but he has also had a tremendous track record on women's rights. They do not have to wear the abaya. They are free <laughs> not to get married if they don't want to. They are free to get, women are free to get divorces if they want. And the kind, when we talk about Sharia, what I mean is that the Islamic, the, the, the Libyan rebels want the women to wear the burqa. An abaya is the burqa where they cover their hair and stuff. They don't have to do that now. They're going to have to do it in the future. They, are, they do not want the women to have the right to reject marriage proposals. Under Qaddafi's government, they have the, an imam actually visits the women before a marriage and sits them with them privately, which is really unheard of, and makes sure that the women are not being pressured into a marriage. And if the, if the woman says, the young woman says that she is being pressured, the imam is under the law of Libya, the imam has to protect the woman from the abuse of the relatives. And so he has to give her a chance to reject the marriage when nobody is there to pressure her to do it. Because, Islam, because this is what happens in Islamic families. Right now, there is a counter coup going on in Libya, <laughs> in Benghazi, and the, they have. There's all kinds of dramatic stuff that's happening. So Qaddafi's. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, that's true. So, but it's still, it's, it's, you know, so. 
Hasn't Gaddafi been a pretty good ally to the West in recent years? Absolutely. So why is, you, why is NATO supporting the rebels if they're in favor of Sharia? I don't understand why NATO is supporting them. It is, it is very interesting. Um, Gaddafi has, uh, oil, Libyan oil costs $1 per barrel to produce, and the United States had preferential contracts already. We, the United States and France and, it, and, and Britain all had, they could take as much oil as they wanted. And most of the oil does not come to the United States. It does, however, go to Italy and France and Britain. So it's a major source of European oil. And yet, the, what Qaddafi was doing was, Qaddafi also has gold. And I think it's very interesting that we have this fi major financial crisis, and now we're attacking a country that has both oil and a huge private reserve of gold on its own land, and like 500 I'm, I'm, I, I would have to double check this fact, but it's like 500 tons of gold in its bank vaults. 143. 143, I, I stand corrected. 143 tons of gold, correct? Something like that. Something like that. And we, we're trying to take their gold and their oil. And, and it's so dirty, it's a dirty fight, and it's just... Why would these radical fundamentalists want to let us have the oil and the gold once they win? Well, that, you know, you, you should be in Washington. That, that's the kind of thing that makes sense. But that, that's what they, you know, the, the Americans are choosing to believe that they're going to have this sweetheart deal. And I am agreeing with you. I think that as soon as they get in, they're going to say, you know, too bad. It's like, you know, you know and, and privately, I get emails from some of these, I mean, because they know me, that they, they know that I'm out there. I'm against the rebels. And they do send me, I do get emails that are very nasty emails. And they said, do you really think we'll sell out and give you our, our gold for free? Do you really think we're going to do that? And I'm like, well, I think that Hillary Clinton thinks you're going to do it. And I think that, yeah. that you know, David Cameron in Britain thinks you're going to do it. And, and, and also, um, I do have documentation that Israel has promised. I ha actually have an Israeli military document, okay, in Hebrew that I've had translated. And it says that the Israelis are, and, and okay, this is just what it says, that it, it's, this is a primary document, and I have, you know, it says that Israel will provide financial support to the rebels in exchange for a military base in Libya, in the Green Mountains, and that they, they call it, the military base will be called one by one, and the, and the Green Mountains is where, close to where the gold is, which I find very interesting. So. Uh, I just have a brief point about. Okay. Uh, There's one the, woman who's had her hand oh, up oh, all oh, night. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Please. And I'm a woman. Uh, okay, that's good. Susan, I really, I'm just sorry, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, I'm very interested in your constitution how you're dealing with all of this. I've been really impressed with all the interviews I've heard and how you seem to be like a really grounded, confident, yet buoyant person. And um, I don't know, just sharing what you have, like a sense of humor and the sense of irony. I like to think I have that, but how, how, do, how do people deal, go through what you've gone through? Like all, you know, are people we know being called into grand jury, being put into what's that detention called? With, um, the, the communication center detention. That is a very scary thing. And Bradley Manning, like when it gets that bad, like how, how can we be sure that people can still stand up and talk like you are today? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, when I was locked up in Carswell, I cried every day. And when I, well, not when I first went in. I was there supposedly, when I first went in, I was told it was going to be four months and then I'd be released. And the first four months, I was okay. Because I was like, you know, I'm going to get out of this. You know, and I'm going to tell, you know, and, and boy, am I going to have a story to tell, and they're not going to shut me up. But at, when they refused to release me, and I realized that I was not going home, and they said, and at that point, they dropped the bomb on me that they were trying to hold me indefinitely. And only, only when I thought I was going to be held indefinitely, and then that continued for another eight months, uh, I became absolutely terrified out of my mind. And I began to have very serious post-traumatic stress. Well, you were saying you hadn't gone through depression before, and I was just wondering how... I, I went through deep anxiety, and I was just... I, I, it, it was like my, my blood pressure was... Uh, the stress level was like it was like a war, a constant war. I was so frightened. Uh, I, I actually <clears throat> colored my hair. 
Okay? My hair actually went white. And it, it did. <laughs> it went white. <laughs> so you had contact with people you needed to have contact with? No, no. And I'll tell you something. I was in, I was locked in prison, and they would not let my, I, my, my, I had a, at that point I had a public attorney who made no effort to get me out. And my uncle, who, God bless his heart, was a, lived in Illinois, was driving 700 miles. He was an attorney, though. He had 40 years of experience in co corporate law. So he was not a criminal attorney, but he had a very good, he was an outstanding attorney. He read the law. He, I mean, he, he read up on my type of law. He studied what I needed to do and to, to get move out of the situation. And he made three efforts to see me. But uh, because I was in locked up in a, what they call a now they're calling a communications center. Yeah, scary, scary people. Yeah, they and all the political prisoners, all the women political prisoners are being held in Carswell. So if any of you guys are ever arrested on the Patriot Act, you'll be seeing the inside of Carswell too. But they don't have to let the the attorneys onto the base. And so my even though he was both family and an attorney and he was coming on visiting hours he was showing up when he you know when other family members were allowed on the base like if you were in prison and you would be able to have your family members show up he wasn't asking for any special privileges we filled all the forms it was all reported correctly he would show up at the base and they would say you're going to see that iraqi agent you are not coming into our base no there is no prison here and then they said there was no visiting hours on the weekends. And other people were going right around him and he said, you can go in, you can go in, you are not going in. And he drove 700 miles in each direction. And believe it or not, there's, a, there's an affidavit from him in the back of my book. And so it's all, what I'm telling you is confirmed. It's like it sounds extraordinary, but it is confirmed. But how did I keep my spirits up? Um, I was terrorized. I was absolutely frightened out of my wits. And it was such a, you know, a ju I, I'm just jubilant that it's over. That it's just, you know, it's just, I, I had a, a wonderful, I did have a wonderful, loving companion who died. He died two days after the court granted my request for a hearing. For four years we lived together, and he fought for me to have that hearing. And then as soon as we got, he had cancer at the end. And as soon as he found out that we had the hearing, he died. Two day, he didn't even live 48 hours after that. And so then I had to have the hearing without him. And that was like very traumatic. But I, he always had this attitude that was really cool, which was, you know, he hated self-pity. And he wasn't going to tolerate it. And he was like, you know, you chose your values. And you have to, you know, and he had this attitude. He was like, you know, you chose your values, and when you believe in something, you have to be willing to pay the consequence, to pay the price for your values, and you have to take your consequences. And and he said, you should be, if you if you really believe in what you did, then you should be proud of yourself, and don't let these people take this away from you. So that was his attitude. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. And just one last question. For sure. Me. I'm just not familiar with the word asset. Robin asked that question too. Can you just help me clar tell, clarify what that really is? Is that like a secretary? Or oh no, no, no. An asset is uh, an asset is like an operative. It's like an it's like a field operative, except uh, an asset is the one. An asset is a, a human asset is the eyes and ears that goes into the situation, into the room, and has direct contact with events. So assets are very, that's why assets are, are trained to be very, uh, we, we are trained to be very uh, observant of the full situation and to dis be very descriptive of what we're doing. And not, we're, we're trained not to change what we've seen for any reason. And that's a real, that was a real threat to the Bush administration because it's just like you don't ever change your story. Because the, the detail that you think is small that you think you might compromise could turn out to be very important because you are compartmentalized and you're like seeing a picture of this and they need to know what this is they need to see what you see right here even if you don't know what's over there or what's over there they have to know that this here that you're reporting 
is, is as accurate and precise as possible. Yeah, a spot. yeah. Okay. except that they, yeah, basically, with the exception in this situation that the Libyans and the Iraqis both knew who I was the, from the first day that we went in, and they and, and, and the reason that the Libyans knew immediately, once I told the Libyans, it was over. I mean, I couldn't ever, you can't ever take it back. And that was that my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, was involved in the, the Lockerbie case, and he wanted to be a witness testifying in the Lockerbie case. And so we were starting, before I ever went to the Iraqis, we started talks for, for the Lockerbie trial with Libya, and we wanted the Libyans to know that if they would accept the trial, that his testimony would help get exonerate their people. So then I had to tell them who I was. And so they knew. But I remember the, the first conversation I had with uh, uh, Mr. Amara at the Libyan embassy. He was, he's like, we want to know why you are here. This is a very important question. It requires a very important answer. And so he was like, oh, we want to know, what the heck are you doing? Because you people just didn't, in 1995, when I established contact with the Libya House, people just didn't wander into the Libya House. Believe me. You know, and if I, had not been a, if I had not been an asset, the FBI would have arrested me the minute I came out of there. You know, so they, they, they were told not to touch me. <laughs> so... After you were locked up for a year, and then it was five years total that you weren't allowed to say anything? Well, five years I was under indictment. Okay. So when you're so under you're indictment, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. However, what they had done was very clever, because when I was released from prison, the corporate media told everybody I was crazy. I'd been, I had been declared, quote, incompetent to stand trial. And so I must be, you know, there must be something really wrong with me, so most people wouldn't listen to what I had to say anyway. And then, no, no, did was, anybody I, I was, say anything when you were starting to come out with this? And, and have you ever heard from anybody at your Mr. whatever his name is at the CIA again? Well, very good questions. Um, I was actually under indictment for 18 months before I got sent to prison, and then I was held for a year. So th when I'm released from prison, that's actually the halfway mark of my case. Then I found uh, another attorney, and it took him about another... 18 months, it took eight, to try to understand what I'm saying to you. Two and a half years I'm under indictment and I'm released from prison. For another 18 months, the court refuses to grant me a hearing after I've been released from prison. Because I get another attorney, he says, we'll take, I can take her case, I can work with this woman. As far as I'm concerned, she is competent to help me assist in, my, in this defense. She is capable of assisting in her own defense if I'm taking it. He went into court, he stood in front of the judge, he assured the judge that he could work with me, this was not going to be a problem. Because the reason anyone's declared incompetent is if they're not capable of helping their attorney in the case. What kind of court was it that you U.S. Federal Court, Southern District of New York. The, the, second, the first judge was uh, Judge Michael Mukasey. He then retired and a new judge took over, Loretta Preska. Her husband worked for Daddy Bush. Oh, yeah. There's, a There's a surprise. So after that, Sorry. what happened until now? Oh, and then um, I uh, was, uh, uh, so we did have the hearing uh, in June of 2008, right before the presidential election in November. And from, we had begun having, uh, doing radio, to, uh, like the, people like Michael Herzog, at Oracle Broadcasting, Republic Broadcasting, the internet radio was giving me a lot of attention. And they were like, and, and, and they were helping to defend me. And um, when we had the nine, my, my witness testified in court about the 9-11 warnings, then it exploded out more. But again, you, you know, the, the, the most people, yeah, only, but on the internet, people who like pay attention to the internet do know this story. And then they began to they began to talk about it a lot more, uh, but you know. But then my case continued another year, and my, my CIA handler I'm told has said that he's very sorry for what that he he thinks it's really a shame what they did to me. He feels sorry for me. He does not feel sorry for what he did, but he 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 says that I'm very sorry that, that, that they screwed Susan. But he didn't give me any money for my legal defense. Anybody about the book? 
Oh, they, when I do radio interviews, they, there, there are funny things that happen, like my phone will cut out, and it'll just go dead. Like, I, I make sure that I have my batteries charged and all this stuff, and the phone will just drop dead, drop out, and, and, and just the battery will just disappear. Or if they can't kill the phone call, sometimes there'll be like a loud beeping noise. Beep, beep, beep. And all the way like through an hour interview without stop, it'll just continue all the way through. They came up and threatened your publisher? Or oh, well, well, I have had to self-publish it. Okay. Because, the, because the corporate press was like, they, they're like, no one wants to hear about 9-11. No one wants to hear this. And then, and then we were afraid we had some, we did have some smaller publishers who were willing to take it, but we were very much afraid at that point that a smaller publisher would be threatened and then they would close the book and they'd stop it. And so I decided that the safest way to go forward would be to self-publish it and with my hopefully, you know, by the time it's, you, by the time you realize I've got 700 footnotes, I've got the documents in here. I've got, you know, the affidavits in there, and, 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 and now I'm safe because no one has sued me, no one's threatened to sue me, and so hopefully in the future, if I write a second book, then hopefully they'll pick up this one and, and both of them will be distributed. So, thank you. Anyway, this is like... <laughs>